Brethren, in Matthew chapter 24, there are warnings that uh, Christ gives to His people, to His servants, uh, in response to the disciples' question, what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, we went through these warnings at an earlier time. I know I did in a sermon down here. But I want to call your attention to one specific one. There's three specific warnings that he gives in Matthew 24, uh, beginning on down in in, uh, verses 9 through 12. He talks about the fact that many will be offended, many will be deceived by false prophets, and the love of many will grow cold. So many will become lukewarm, many will become deceived, and many will become offended. Now, being offended is the first one of these issues that he discusses. He says in Matthew 24, verse 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. So he warned about many being offended. Now, why are so many people offended? Why will so many be offended? What is it that offends them? And how do you avoid being in the category? of the many who are offended. Perhaps I, I might uh, go into it later times. How do you, uh, asking the same questions on, on the matter of deception and on the matter of becoming lukewarm? Because there are three different categories. You know, one is, is the matter of being offended, being just... Uh, uh, if you look up the word offend in, in the uh, Greek language, you find that it comes from a root word that means to stumble. To, to offend means to cause someone to stumble. You know what happens if there's... Uh, Uh, something in the way and you don't see it and you stumble over it, you lose your footing, you can fall, uh, you can get hurt. Uh, It interferes with your progress down the pathway. So when someone is offended, they have stumbled. Now, there are those who will stumble and there are those who will be deceived and there are those who will become lukewarm. And the same thing doesn't have to happen to all uh, three. All three don't have to happen to one person. But any one of those three categories leads to very serious consequences. And none of us want to be in any of those three categories because if we wanted to be in one of those categories, we certainly wouldn't be here this afternoon. And frankly, I don't think that, uh, I don't care uh, which congregation or, you know, wherever it is, uh, I think if you ask in any of any congregation, they could ask over across town and say, how many of you want to be in one of these three categories? All raise your hand. We're, we're having a sign-up list uh, back here. Uh, I don't think they'd get many names on the signature list. I don't think people say, well, yeah, you know, that's really why I've come to church. I, I've come here to be offended. Well, not me. Uh-uh. I've come here to be deceived. That's, that's really what I want to do. I said, well, you know, really what I came here for was, was a good afternoon sleep. I'm, I'm lukewarm, and uh, I, I just came here to get a little, little more lukewarm uh, and, and have my love grow cold. So, uh, you know, I don't think that's why people go. Do you? I mean, I, I don't. I don't think any of you do. We're not here for those reasons, and I don't think uh, any of our brethren who are anywhere else go there specifically because that's what they're desiring and they're going there trying to find out how to be in one of those three categories. Well, the question is not the fact of people wanting to be in those categories. The question is, Christ said, many will be. Many will be. Not one or two, not some isolated individual, but many will be. Now, if many will be, and none of us want to be, how do we avoid it? Well, let's just focus specifically on on the matter of being offended Which, let me ask you to begin with, let's look a little bit. Why are people, why do people become offended? What what is it that offends them? What what offends people? Well, let's look at the first category of things, or that, uh, the first category of that which causes offense. James chapter 3 and verse 2. It says, In many things we offend all. Or, as other translations, more modern English renders it, in many things we all offend. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. Now, what's the first thing that causes offense? We do. You know, put your name in there, my name in there, whoever, you know. In many things we all offend. So what's one of the sources of, of, of offense? Every one of us. It says... If any man offends not in word, the same as a perfect man. If you never offend, you always say the right thing at exactly the right time. You never offend.
offend anybody with your words. You are a perfect man. You, Hey, you need to be telling the rest of us how to do that. Because in many things, we all offend. We all, we all stick our foot in our mouth sometimes, don't we? Am I the only one that's ever done that? <laughs> and we all have said things and we say, I can't believe I said that. Why did, or, or, or maybe our wife or our husband says, why did you say that? Well, I don't know, you know, it just well, it came out. No, you see, the, the first thing that causes offense is people cause offense. People. Not just some bad guy here or some terrible person over there, but people, including every person. All of us, is, at one time or another, we say things we shouldn't say. So people offend people. That's the, that's the first thing we find... The Apostle James goes through and he discusses the matter of the tongue and controlling the tongue and bridling the tongue because things come out. We say things. We offend with our words. And we're going to see a little later, we can, there, there are those that offend with other things. Now let's go back to the book of Matthew and let's look at something else because we see that there are, there are different categories, different ways of offending. There are times when you can inadvertently offend there are those, as we're going to see, whose lives are an offense. You know, there's what we can call an, an inadvertent or an accidental offense, and there are those offenses that really just are a reflection of an offensive way of life. Now, in Matthew 18, you remember the story, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Evidently, they've been having an argument as to which one of them was going to be the most important. And uh, you remember the story. One time, James and John's mother uh, came and said, look, i got a request. And if you check it through, you find out she was actually Jesus' aunt. And so, she, you know, a little family pressure. James and John were his cousins. And she said, uh, I've got a request for you, nephew. Uh, you know, my boys here, you know... Really, I think when you come into your kingdom, you ought to put one of them on your right hand, one of them on your left. They ought to be your two right-hand men. And uh, nothing like a little family politics see, here or there. And, and, of course, you, you know, that didn't work. That, that was not, Christ said, no, it's not mine to, to give that. But they came, they said, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Christ called a little child. And he set the little child in the middle and he said, I'm telling you, except you be converted unless you are changed. That's what conversion means. It has to do with a change of direction. So they were sitting over here arguing about who's the most important. And he says, if you don't become different and become just like this little child, you're not even going to be there. Oh, that's a strong statement. Unless you're converted and become as a little child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So you don't need to be arguing about who's going to be the greatest, which one of you is going to be more important than the others. If you don't change your direction and become more childlike, you won't even be there. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So Christ brought out here that humility was the key to greatness. Then he said, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and that he was drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. It must need be that offenses come, but woe be to that man by whom the offense comes. Wherefore, if your hand or your foot offends you, cut them off, cast, you from, cast them from you. It's better to enter into the kingdom, into life, halt and maimed, than having two hands or two feet to be cast into fire. If your eye offends you, pluck it out, cast it from you. Better to enter into life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Now, is he talking about literally chopping off your hand or your foot or, or plucking out your eye? Is that going to solve the problem? You see, what is it? He's saying, if something causes you to stumble, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, that's what the word offend means. See, if that's tripping you up, if that's getting you in trouble, no matter how precious, how close it is to you, don't let something cause you to stumble. Now, Notice that he's talking about two different things. One, up here in, verses, in verse 6, he starts talking about offending a little one. Now, what is he talking about, a little one? Is he talking about uh, this little child here? No, he's talking about a spiritual little one. He says, one of these little ones which believe in me. So he's talking about somebody who is brand new to the truth, who's just learning, who's just becoming introduced, who's, who has not 
grounded himself, who's not really proved and, and understood very much, they're just coming into an awareness of the truth. And they are hurt and turned away by those who are there who should know better. They are caused to stumble before they ever get started on the path. We're going to see a little later that that's a different category than those who are already on the path that something comes up and causes them to stumble. He says he talks about those who, who are just beginning to start out, who are little ones, who are like babes, and they're just learning. And he says that's a serious thing. You need to be careful. Next thing he says is if you've got something that's causing you to stumble in your own life, even if it's your hand or your foot or your eye, well, now, I think we all know if I steal something with my hand, is my hand the problem? No, my mind is the problem. My mind is what told my hand to reach out and grab it and stick it in my pocket. Uh, if, you know, I tell a lie, is the problem my tongue? Well, no, not really. The problem's in my mind. The tongue simply obeyed the mind. If I, you know, am looking at something and lusting after it, is the problem my eye? No, the problem's my mind. I could lose my eyes and still uh, think about it in my mind. So Christ is, is using an illustration to say, look, when somebody is... Humility is the key. If you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you need to have a childlike attitude. You need to be humble. When you see somebody who's just coming, uh, who's, who's new and who's fresh, you need to realize it's a serious thing to cause that person to stumble. They haven't even gotten on the right track yet, and, and here you're tripping them up and causing them to stumble and, and to fall, and that's a very serious matter. If you've got something, no matter how close it is to you, that's causing you to trip up, you better get rid of it. Don't let something remain in your life uh, that is con keeping you from going in the way that you should go. And then he says in verse 10, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you in heaven, uh, their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. He's talking about an attitude then toward others and, and using here this little child. You know, God sets angels to, to watch over uh, these little children. And he says you shouldn't have an attitude of looking down on someone that you may view as being unimportant. He says, The Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. If a man has a hundred sheep and one goes astray, he leaves the ninety-nine and goes and looks for the one that's astray. And he rejoices when he finds it. And so he says, It's not the will of, my, of your father, verse 14, uh, that one of these little ones should perish. God wants to see people get on the track and make that and stay on the track. He says, if you're, verse 15, he says, if your brother shall trespass against you. So your brother causes an offense. Now he's talking to people that are in the church. He's not talking about somebody who's, who's a, a babe who hasn't gotten started yet. You see, you, you're looking here in two different categories. One is, is someone who is brand new, who's just on the verge of getting started. They're, uh, they're, they're young, they're naive, they, they can be caused to stumble by the scandal that they see in, in words or actions. Now he addresses the disciples. He's addressing those who are uh, his followers. And he says, if your brother trespass against you, you know, if he, offend, if he does something to offend you, you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you gain your brother. And if he won't hear you, uh, then you take one or two more. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. If he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. If he neglect to hear the church, let him be as a heathen and a publican. So Christ then addresses the matter of offenses in a, in a little different category. He said, if somebody does something to you, then there is a way to deal with that. And you go and you talk to the individual. You don't go and, and start... Uh, you know, trying to badmouth them and get everybody on your side and what a, what a bum they are, you go to them and, and you try to handle it in, in a private way. And then, uh, if necessary, you involve a couple of others. Now let's go back to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse 24. This is a parable that he put forth, that the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that sows good seed in his field. And while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth, then appeared the tares also. Well, the question was, what has happened? Tares have been sowed among, sown among the wheat. An enemy has done this, verse 28, 
And the servant said, well, you want us to go and gather all the tares out? And he said, no, because if you start trying to, to get all of those out, you'll root up some of the wheat with it. They'll both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, the reapers will gather the wheat. Uh, they'll gather together the tares and bind them and burn them and gather the wheat into my barn. Now, he comes on down a little later and explains it. In verse 36, uh, they said, Declare unto us the parable of the tares. And he said, Well, he that sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. Uh, the reapers are the angels. The tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of this age. The son of man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend or all of that which is scandalous, and them which do iniquity, and cast them into the furnace of fire. Now here he's talking about those that cause offense, and they cause offense not by an inadvertent word. They cause offense not in the same category as James 3.2 when it says, we all offend at one time or another by saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Here he's talking about people who live and practice the way of lawlessness, which do iniquity. They, their conduct is a scandal. They are an offense. You know, over the years in God's church, I have seen many times where people, particularly uh, those who were sometimes newer or weaker, were caused offense by the lawless conduct of individuals that were simply tares among the wheat. They, you, know, you know, you can go back and look at the example of Judas. Uh, I remember many years ago, in fact, it was when I first came to Corpus Christi. It was, exa- it was 20 years ago. Uh, I remember sitting and talking with someone, and they had taken offense because of certain things that they had heard, certain, uh, uh, a certain scandal uh, involving an individual who was the treasurer of the church at that time and uh, they had heard certain things and were really bothered and uh, very disturbed about the whole idea of tithing uh, because they had heard various things, and they were offended by rumors of scandal. And we discussed it for a while and discussed the subject of tithing, and I finally asked them, I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, if you had lived in the days of Christ, if you had lived there in the first century and had been in Jerusalem, in 30 A.D., and you could have walked up to Jesus Christ personally and handed Him your tithe, would you have believed in tithing in that circumstance? Oh, yeah. Now, that would have been different. If I could have walked up and just handed it to Him, well, that would that, that, be good. I, yeah, I'd tithe then. I said, well, let me ask you something. If you had done that, walked up and handed Christ the tithe, what do you think Jesus would have done with it? A blank stare on their face? Well, I don't know. never really thought of that. And I said, I can tell you exactly what He would have done with it he would have turned around and given it to Judas because Judas was the keeper of the bag. Judas was the treasurer. He was the keeper of the bag, so I can tell you exactly what he'd have done with it. He'd have given it to Judas, and I can tell you what Judas would have done with it. He'd have stolen some of it because he was a thief. And that's not a rumor. That says so right in the book of John. So, uh, you know, I don't just suspect. I I hadn't just heard a third-hand rumor that Judas may be skimming a little off the top. I know for a fact he was because it says so in the Bible. It says he was the keeper of the bag and he was a thief. And I said, would you have been offended at Jesus Christ and decided He couldn't be the Messiah and you were just going to quit and go be a Pharisee or something? (laughs) Maybe go to the temple of Dagon and worship uh, Him or what? Well, they never thought of it that way before. You see, God allowed the devil to sow a few tares among the wheat. And down through time, there have been those... And it's talking here about a way of life, about an attitude. It's talking about those which do iniquity, those which practice the way of lawlessness. It's not talking about a slip that is a sort of a one-time thing. It's not talking about... We all understand that none of us does everything perfectly every second of every day. I look around here and I see people who've been in the church for, you know, in a lot of cases, 20, 30 years and more. And I think any of us look at our lives and we realize, you know... From the day I was baptized till now, I haven't been totally perfect. I I have made mistakes. I've said things I shouldn't have said. I've done things. I've I've done things that, oh, I wish I I, I could have undone. Well, we have, haven't we? He's not talking about something that involves a a slip-up that you repent of and that you go on. He's talking about those who simply follow 
the way of lawlessness, who are a scandal by their lives and who cause problems. So what is it that's going to cause people to be offended? Well, one of the main things that causes people to be offended is other people. And we all at one time or another cause an offense by saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. There are those whose lives are scandalous who have been sown in among the wheat and who serve as a perpetual problem, it seems, and have caused and hurt many. There are those who have been new, who have been sort of babes in Christ that have never even really gotten started on the path because they've been hurt and turned off by, by, by some of that. In other cases, we are going along the path and things come up and somebody who is a brother uh, says or does something, they trespass, they, they, uh, they do things that are offensive. And Christ says in cases like that, you go to them privately and you talk about it. Now, we're going to see a little later on that there are three keys to avoiding being offended. But let's go on. We find what causes offense? People cause offense. Now, I'll tell you something else that can cause offense. That's just the plain, unvarnished truth. You know what? Christ caused offense in in Isaiah chapter 8. So you don't have to be wrong to cause offense. Now, being wrong can cause offense. And we've all been wrong. We've all caused offense that way at one time or another. But you know, sometimes we can cause offense by simply doing the truth, telling the truth, living the truth. Notice in in Isaiah 8, this was uh, prophesied, Isaiah 8, 13. It says, Sanctify the Lord of hosts Himself, and let Him be your fear, and let Him be your dread. You know, really uh, walk with God. And He shall be for a sanctuary. He's going to be there to protect you, but you know what else He's going to be? for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. Talking here about Christ and His ministry. And it said there were many who were going to stumble and fall and be broken and be snared. Many were going to be offended by Christ. You see, that's a lot of times what people don't think about, that Christ warned that many would be offended by Him. Back in Matthew 11, Matthew 11, notice what Jesus said that uh, in, in uh, Matthew 11 too, when John heard in the prison the works of Jesus, he sent two of his disciples. And he said unto him, here's what the disciples said when they came to Jesus, Are you he that should come, or do we look for another? Are you truly the Messiah? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So Christ said, Blessed is he that will not be offended in me. You see, Christ knew that the truth sometimes offended. In Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 54, when he was coming to his own country, he taught them in the synagogue and so much that they were astonished. And they said, where has this man got all this wisdom and these mighty works? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother uh, called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are not they all with us? Whence then has this man all these things? And they were offended in him. Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. They were offended because they said, Where does he get off doing all this stuff? Where did he learn all this? Why, we saw him grow up. Why, I've known his mother for years. I've known his brothers and his sisters. Why, I saw him. I remember him way back when he was running around playing behind the rock piles. Where does he come up with all this stuff and he's doing all these things? And they were offended. They really took offense that somebody they knew somehow was here telling them these things. They were offended at the truth. They were offended at Christ. Things weren't exactly the way they thought it ought to be. Now, Christ even offended the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 15, let's pick it up in verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were in Jerusalem. And they said, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands when they eat bread. Now, this is not talking about just sort of a simple washing your hands because they're dirty. 
The Pharisees had a great ceremony of the washing of the hands. They washed them all the way up their elbows. And the reason they washed them, if they had been out in the marketplace coming in contact with sinners, they were afraid that their hands had become defiled because they had touched something that a sinner had touched, maybe had brushed against somebody, and had were defiled. And so they went through this ritual of washing before they touched the bread because they were afraid that if they didn't, they would... Their hands had been defiled by touching a sinner. They would touch the bread, defile the bread, eat the bread. They would be defiled, and oh, that would be terrible. And so they had concocted this. These aren't, you can look, it's not in Leviticus, it's not in Deuteronomy, it's not in the law of God. These were little additions that they had made. And so they had come up with these traditions, and now they were upset because Christ was not, his disciples weren't following those traditions. He answered and said unto them, Well, why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Oh, God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother. And he that curses his father or mother, let him die the death. You say, Whosoever shall say to his father or mother, It's a gift by whatsoever you may be profited by me. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draws near to me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. For in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He called the multitude, and he said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth, that defiles a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended after they heard your saying? Boy, you know, I think you offended those guys. And Christ went out and said, Oh, please, I'm so sorry I offended. No. And he, what did Christ say? He said, Every plant that my Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall in the ditch. Now, the Pharisees were offended. Why were they offended? They were offended because Christ told them the truth. They were offended by the truth. You find that... You're going to be offended by people if you don't have a forgiving attitude. You're going to be forget. You're going to be offended by the truth if you don't love the truth more than you love your own way. Now, those who we notice as, as we'll go on here a little bit, see, they didn't love the truth. They loved their own way. They loved uh, various other things that uh, that were in the way. Well, the Pharisees took offense. Christ gave them some very stern correction. Uh, he exhorted them. Now, if we come on down, let's notice a little further. Christ began to explain. See, the subject, so, sometimes, so, I think we all know some of the Protestants have tried to take this verse out uh, of its context and, and to uh, pretend as though, well, this is talking about that, the, uh, that, that you eat unclean food and all of that. Well, clean and unclean food is not even up for discussion here. What's up for discussion is touching bread, is touching food, with unwashed hands that had not been ceremonially and ritually washed. And Christ said, spiritual defilement doesn't come because you put a piece of bread in your mouth before you had gone through this ritual of washing. Defilement is what comes out of the mouth. See, he comes right on down and he said in verse 17, don't you understand? Whatever enters in at the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the draught. You know, it just goes right on through the digestive system and comes out. The things which proceed out of the mouth Come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. Out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, false witness, blasphemies. Out of the heart, out of the mind, out of the deep, innermost being of the person comes forth sin. Sin originates in the heart. It originates in our attitudes down deep inside. It's not just purely the physical act. These are the things which defile a man. To eat with unwashed hands doesn't defile a man. That's not what makes you unclean. Then Jesus went and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, you son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a demon. And he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away. She cries after us. But Christ didn't respond at first. He just ignored her and went on. And she kept uh, beseeching him. And the disciples said, look, you know, send her away. She's making a bunch of noise. But he answered and said, I am sent not but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's 
you know, what, what I'm here for. That's where I came for. Uh, that's where my ministry is being accomplished. And she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and he said, you know, it's not fitting to take the children's bread and cast it to the puppies here under the table. And she said, that's true, Lord. But you know, the dogs, the little puppies, eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it unto you even as you will. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now, I want you to contrast the attitude of the Syrophoenician woman with the Pharisees. They were offended. She wasn't. At what point here did she become offended and say, Well, I'm out of here. Boy, you're not going to talk to me that way. Notice what she had. You know what the, one of the biggest differences between the Syrophoenician woman and the Pharisees were? The difference between pride and humility. See, the Pharisees were filled with pride. When you're filled with pride, you can't take correction because you've got a standing and a reputation and a status to maintain, and you take offense at anything that is corrective. This woman had the attitude of a little child. She was humble, and she said, Well, look, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, get you to divert your whole ministry and mission. I'll take the crumbs off the table. And Christ marveled at her faith. He said, Your faith. You know, this attitude of faithfulness, this attitude of, of recognition, of a deep awareness of who Jesus Christ really was. And this is the, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting when you look that some of the greatest examples uh, that, uh, uh, that we see in the, in the Scriptures, Christ uh, pointed out in several cases. You remember the Roman centurion who came and Christ offered to go to his house to heal the, uh, the child? And he said, no, Lord, he said, I'm not worthy that you should enter into my, under my roof. But he said, I understand how authority works. He says, I've been in the army for years. I know how authority works. And all you've got to do is say the word. You know, I tell the soldiers I have, I tell this one, go and he goes, and another one, come and he comes. And I know you have authority. I know you have the authority of God, and all you've got to do is just say the word, and it'll be done. And Jesus marveled. He said, oh, I found this kind of faith in Israel. Here was a woman who exemplified faith and humility. She was not offended by the truth, because she loved the truth, and she had confidence in God. And she was not filled up with a focus on herself. So we notice here two examples. In one case, the truth caused great offense to the Pharisees, and it didn't cause offense to this woman. But it was a difference in the attitude that they had. In John chapter 6, here we see the... What occurred here is Jesus was talking to his disciples, and... Um, we'll find the, as Christ is telling them about the bread of life. Now, in the sermonette, we heard about hungry and thirsting after righteousness. Well, if you hunger after righteousness, what are you going to, to partake of? Well, you're going to have to partake of the bread of life. That's the only thing, uh, the, the, the water of life is the only thing that can quench that sort of thirst, and the bread of life is the only thing that can fill that sort of hunger. Now, Jesus Christ came as the living Word of God. The Bible is the written Word of God. Jesus Christ perfectly personified the Bible. He was the Bible in person. And Christ talked to them about desiring and craving the bread of life. He told them in John 6, 35, He says, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. And He told them in verse 38, I am come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of Him that sent me. This is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that sees the Son, that son, sees the son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And the Jews murmured, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. So they said, why? This is, just, this is Jesus, the son of Joseph. We know his father and mother. And how is it he says he's come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. And he comes on down and he tells them in verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread 
which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh, and I will give it for the life of the world. And the Jews strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said unto them, Truly I say unto you, except you drink the you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. My flesh is meat indeed, my, drink, my blood is drink indeed. He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me, and I in him. And the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eats me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eats of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And Jesus knew in himself his disciples murmured, and he said unto them, Does this offend you? What, and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It's the spirit that quickens, and the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, their spirit and their life. Some of you here don't believe. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. In verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and are sure that you are that Christ, that Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, we find that many of those that believed on Jesus, quote-unquote, were offended and turned aside and went back, <coughs> followed him no more, because he told them the truth. He said, look, you need life, and you don't have life in and of yourselves. I am from God. I am God in the flesh, and you've got to partake of me. I've got to live in you as the Father lives in me for you to have life. And they were offended. They liked certain things about him. They liked certain things that he said. They agreed with certain points here and there. But they couldn't take in the truth. They were offended by the truth. And you find many times people are, defended, are offended by the truth because they don't love the truth more than they love their own way. You go back to the example in Second Chronicles 18 and you read the story of Ahab. Ahab, the husband of Jezebel. If you remember the story, I'll just sort of tell it from, from 2 Chronicles 18. You find that Ahab had made a deal with Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And he had persuaded Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, to help him out because the Syrians had conquered a section of northern Israel. They had taken the cities of Ramoth-Gilead uh, over on the northeastern part uh, of the state of Israel. And Ahab wasn't able to get them back, and he finagled around. So he finally talked Jehoshaphat into entering an alliance. And he said, this is all part of the promised land, and, and you need to come up here and help me. And so he made a big banquet. Jehoshaphat came up, and Ahab had all his big production going on. But Jehoshaphat, while he was a little on the naive side and was sort of suckered into things at various times, Jehoshaphat was a man that did have respect for God, and he wanted to know God's will. So he said, well, look, he said, I'd feel better about this deal if we could talk to a man of God. Well, Ahab had these 400 prophets there, and they were whooping and shouting and uh, having a real Pentecostal camp meeting. Uh, one of them put on little horns, and he was running up and down. And, and, and they just really, he put on quite a show. You can read the account in Second Chronicles 18. And they were leaping, and they were singing and clapping their hands, and they were doing all the things that they were doing. They were putting on all this and said, Go up to Ramoth Gilead. And, and, you know, one of them put this little hat on, and he was running up and down, and he was saying, This is, this is the king Ahab going to do to his enemies. And he was putting on all this show. And Jehoshaphat looked over at Ahab, and he said, Isn't there a prophet of the eternal anywhere around? You know, all these clowns put on quite a show, but I'd really like to talk to a man of God before I get out here. And Ahab said, well, there is one, Micaiah, the son of Emma. But I hate him. Oh, no, don't, don't say things like that, Jehoshaphat said. And Ahab says, I hate him. He never has anything good to say. He never agrees with me. And I hate him. Ahab said, when, you know, when I go to church and these other guys are there, they tell me what a nice king I am, and they tell me, uh, you know, that God loves me and He likes everything I'm doing and everything is great and wonderful, and, and, and I just come away happy. You know, they just make me feel so good, and they tell me whatever I want to hear. But this fellow, this Micaiah, I don't like him. Well, 
Jehoshaphat wouldn't go up to battle until they heard from Micaiah. So they sent, Ahab sent a servant to go get Micaiah. The servant came in there to Micaiah and he said, Now look, one thing before you go up there. The king has already asked 400 prophets. And they have all unanimously agreed with one voice that God is with him. Now just this once, tell him what he wants to hear. Just for once, don't be a spoil sport. Don't go in there and give him some stuff that's going to make him mad. Just once, tell him. Just agree with everybody else. Well, they came in there and Ahab and Joshua were sitting there. Micaiah came in and Micaiah looked at Ahab and he said, By all means, go on up to battle. Ahab looked at him and I guess maybe the sort of mocking, sarcastic way that Micaiah had of saying it upset Ahab and he said, Look! He said, how many times have I told you, tell me the truth? Well, it's probably the first time he'd ever said it, but anyway, he sort of was trying for effect, you know. And Micaiah looked at him, he said, all right, he said, I'm going to tell you the truth. He says, I saw a vision about this, and he said, I'll tell you exactly what I saw. I saw all Israel scattered like sheep without a shepherd, because you're going to go out there and get killed. So by all means, go ahead. And he said, I'll tell you something else. He said, all these 400 around here? He says, you know, there was a conference up in heaven. God had the devil up there, and he asked for suggestions uh, to get you out there. And one of the demons volunteered to come down and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all your prophets. So that's how come you've heard all this stuff. But by all means, go ahead. And Ahab looked over at Jehoshaphat, and he said, didn't I tell you so? He never has anything good to say. Ahab gave a little thought to the matter a little later. This shows you how naive Jehoshaphat was. He was a trusting soul. He's the kind of guy you'd love to have tried to sell a used car to or something because he was just the most trusting soul that there ever was. Uh, a little later, Ahab comes up to Jehoshaphat. They're going to go out to battle. Ahab said, look, tell you what. He says, I think you ought to wear all of your kingly garments. Put your crown on. You know, really look impressive. And get out there. He says, hey, you really look sharp and all that stuff. I'm just going to wear some of this old scrungy stuff. Uh, you know, and I'll just sort of go out there. But he said, you really look good in this robe and this crown. Why don't you get in that and stand up in the chariot and go out there and parade up and down in front? And Jehoshaphat fell for it. And you read there as you go through the story, you know, what happened? Well, the Syrians saw Jehoshaphat and they thought it was the king and they all converged and God had mercy on them. They got close and they saw it was the wrong king, so they left. And one of them just shot an arrow into the air and it fell to earth right through Ahab, uh, whom they didn't even know from Adam. You know, he was just out there sort of sneaking around the, uh, the, the, the battle to see what was going on. Uh, thought he was disguised, and he was. They didn't recognize him, but he still got shot. The point was Ahab did not have a love for the truth. Ahab wanted to hear what he wanted to hear. You come all the way back to the New Testament, and you read that Paul told Timothy, he says, the time is coming when the people will not endure sound doctrine. They'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They won't endure sound doctrine. They don't want to be corrected. They don't want to hear the truth. They want to be patted on the head and told they're nice and everything's happy and going about their way. The truth can hurt and the truth can cause offense. If you want to contrast with Ahab, go and read Second Samuel 12 when you read the story of David when Nathan the prophet confronted him after his sin with Bathsheba. If you read 2 Samuel 11, you read of all of the finagling and all the things that went on. David committed adultery, and then he tried to cover up and finally uh, actually connive this plot that resulted in Uriah's death. And then he married the widow, and she had a baby. And Now, you can imagine how successfully all this was covered up. You know, their servants in the palace, they saw the comings and the goings. Uh, they could count in those days just as we can. And so, you know, the king marries the widow and she has this premature baby, you know, four months later or whatever it was. Uh, and, uh, they, you know, they weren't that dumb. They, they had it all figured out. Nobody said anything in front of him. But you can better believe behind the stairs and in the kitchen and, and, and you know, various corners of the palace, people were whispering and talking and, and, and all of these things for a period of months had been going on. And there's nobody so deceived as the guy who thinks he's putting one over on everybody else. And so poor David really thought that he was covering this whole thing up. And, no, of course, nobody was talking about it openly. He was the king and everybody wanted to stay on good terms. They were, all this stuff was going around. Well, one day Nathan came in. And he said, King, I have a decision. I, I have a matter that's come to my attention, and, and I want you to know about it. And he started telling him the story about this poor man that had one little sheep, and he had raised up this little lamb, and he had it there in his household. And here was a rich man that had all of these uh, flocks and herds, and somebody came to visit him. And so instead of taking from his flocks and herds, he took uh, this poor little sheep that 
belonged to this poor man, took it, slaughtered it, and had it for dinner. Had no pity, no compassion, no mercy. And the king was outraged. He said, the man that has done this thing ought to die. Absolutely incredible that somebody would be so pitiless and so merciless, be so lacking in compassion. Nathan let him storm a little bit. He looked him in the eye and he pointed his finger at him and he said, You, O king, are this man. You are the man that has done this thing. God gave you everything. He gave you all that belonged to your master Saul. He gave you everything in Israel and Judah. You had the whole thing. You had everything you wanted. And then you took this man's wife and you were as guilty of his death as if you had been there to plunge in the blade yourself. You, O king, are this man. Oh, I bet you could have heard a pin drop there in the palace room. Can you imagine the look on people's faces, the color drained away, and everybody looked to see what was going to happen next? And you know what? David said, I have sinned against the Eternal. And if you want to know what David said in the aftermath of this, you can go through, you read the story. You, 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 of course, the baby got sick and died. You read the 51st Psalm, David's Psalm of Repentance. And it's a remarkable psalm. And one of the major things that is remarkable about it is you can read the 51st Psalm from beginning to end and you never find a single excuse or self-justification or passing of the buck. And that is a remarkable thing. It's hard for a person to be corrected and not be trying to shift some of the blame onto somebody else. Yeah, but, but you know, there are a lot of other people, David could say, well, all the other kings do it. How come I'm the only one in trouble? Why don't you go up to Syria and chew him out? And there are a lot of people that have done things, and, and I know, you know, this and that, and besides Bathsheba shouldn't have been taking a bath out there on the, on the, on the roof, and, and, and uh, you know, she knew I could see her from there, and it's really partly her fault, and how come she's not in here and you're chewing her out? And, you know, all the excuses, see, that people come up with. It's human nature to come up with excuses. And all the way back in the Garden of Eden, you know, the very first sin led to the very first excuse. You ever thought of it that way? The very first sin produced the very first excuse. The man blamed his wife. And... and that has happened once or twice in the centuries since, right? Of course, none of you have ever done anything like that, I'm sure. But, but nevertheless, Adam did. Dirty scoundrel that he was. You know, he, God said, Adam, did you take of the fruit of the tree that I told you not to take of? And Adam said, well, uh, the woman. You remember the woman? The one you gave me? You brought her over here and you gave her to me? Now, she took of the fruit of the tree. And she gave me a little bite and I took one too. Uh, and the woman, you know, she took. Adam sort of whizzed by his part. The woman, she's the one. She took it, she did it, and I took a little bite too. And God said to Eve, He said, Eve, He said, is this true? You took of the tree that I told you not to? Well, now, it was like this. I was tricked. The serpent, He beguiled me. And God didn't even want to hear the devil's excuse. <laughs> he didn't even ask the serpent. He didn't want to even hear the devil's excuse. And I'm sure he'd had one. Because he's a liar and the father of a lie, you know. He's pretty good at coming up with excuses. Now, there was a contrast there. There was not a spirit of repentance. When you go and read the 51st Psalm, David says, Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. You know, he says, I was a sinner from the beginning. I'm a sinner from the inside out. He said, In sin did my mother conceive me. You know, he goes through and he expresses his abhorrence of what he sees in himself. He pleads for God's mercy. He doesn't blame anything or anyone. He offers no justification. He doesn't try to pass the buck. He doesn't try to, to say, well, it's not fair, and I think you're being harder on me than you were on somebody else. And, and, and all the excuses people give. David didn't offer a single one. I think that's one of the reasons David was a man after God's own heart because deep down David loved the truth. And he said in the 51st Psalm, he says, you desire truth in the inward parts. David did not take offense against the truth, though the truth hurt and it hurt deeply. And he was humiliated right there in front of everyone. He didn't say go kill Nathan. You read of other kings that did. You know, you can go on back and... and uh, uh, in, in uh, Chronicles, and you can read about uh, the uh, the account of of uh, uh, Joash, uh, who was the uh, actually what the grandson of uh, or great grandson of Ahab, great grandson of Ahab, Ahab's daughter, 
uh, Athaliah had married uh, Jehoshaphat's son, and they had had a child, and this child became king and died quickly after he became king, and Athaliah, the queen mother, didn't want one of her grandchildren to get the throne. She wanted it for herself and tried to murder all the grandkids. Real nice woman, chip off the old block. And, and uh, one little baby was rescued and hidden by the high priest, an elderly man by the name of Jehoiada. He was well advanced in years. He hid this little baby, this little infant, there in the, uh, uh, the precincts of the temple. And later on, when Joash was seven years old, Jehoiada brought him out and, and announced him as king, proclaimed him as king, and Athaliah was taken and executed. And we're told there in Second Chronicles that all the days of Jehoiada, Joash was fine. He listened to Jehoiada, and he he was Jeho, Joash was a man who was heavily influenced by other people, and he listened to Jehoiada, and he was um, guided by him. But Jehoiada was elderly, and he died after jo, Joash was in uh, his young manhood, maybe in his twenties. Jehoiada died. And we're told that after Jehoiada died, came the princes of Judah and made obeisance, and they began to sort of uh, butter him up. And he hearkened to them, and they said, let's go serve other gods. And so he did. And he got seriously off the track, influenced by those that were with him. Jehoiada's son, an elderly priest himself by that time, stood up in the temple and announced to the nation the consequences of God's judgment that was coming on the nation confronted the king that he was responsible for leading the people into idolatry, and the king said, Stony! No longer remembering at all, no longer caring about the fact that this man's father was the only reason he was even alive, much less was there as king. He had no love of the truth. He took offense at the truth. And we find the truth can cause offense. And the truth does cause offense. People can cause offense either by inadvertent, an inadvertent word or, or action. People can cause offense by blatant transgression and sin. The truth itself can cause offense. And, you know, sometimes events. People are offended. People are upset when things happen. In Matthew 13, Matthew 13, 21, we pick up the story in verse 18. Christ said, Hear therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is the seed that was sown by the wayside. He that received the seed into stony places. The same as he that hears the word and anon with joy receives it, yet has he not root in himself but endures for a while when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word by and by he's offended. So here are those who are offended by events. The going got tough, and they left. Troubles, difficulties, persecutions, they're offended. And you know, it's only through much tribulation we enter into the kingdom of God. You know, Christ warned the disciples that some of them were going to be offended. They didn't believe Him at the time. They didn't do what they needed to do to avoid that. In Matthew 26, in verse 30, this is right at the end of the Passover service that Christ conducted for His disciples, in Matthew 26, 30, when they had sung a hymn, they went out of the Mount of Olives. Then said Jesus unto them, All you shall be offended because of me this night. For it's written, I'll smite the shepherd and scatter the sheep. You're going to be offended. Oh, no, they didn't think so. Well, what caused them to stumble? Where did all of their, their loyalty, their devotion, their allegiance go? Well, when the soldiers' swords and spears began to glisten, began to glisten in the light of the full moon, all of their courage and all of their faith began to drain away. And when the going got tough, they were out there. You read that John was the only one that came back around and was there, was there, watched the trial from a distance, but was publicly there and publicly uh, allied himself standing there with the women. Sort of interesting, you know, that uh, um, the disciples, the, the overwhelming majority of the disciples, we get the idea there were only about four people there when Christ was being crucified, four or five. Uh, one of them was a man, John, and the others were the women, Christ's mother and the others. They were the ones that were there right up to the bitter end and had the courage to say, we're with him. Where were the others? They were hiding. They were scared. They were frightened. You know, the going gets tough sometimes, pressures and problems. Christ talked about those who were not well-rooted in the truth. You see, 
the, the seed was sown in stony ground. It was sown in hard places. And it quickly came up, but it had a very shallow root. And trouble and persecution and difficulty came, and they withered. They were offended because of all of the problems. You can read that that sort of thing happens. You remember the... Uh, well, let's go back to John chapter 16. John 16, 1. These things, Jesus said, have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They'll put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time comes. Whoever kills you will think he does God a service. Now, what did he tell them so they wouldn't be offended? He says, you think it's rough now? It's going to get a whole lot worse. He was telling them this, you see, the night of his final Passover. He said, the time is coming. They're going to kick you out. They're going to isolate you. Yeah, the time's coming. You may be killed. They're going to think they're doing God a service. Well, what did he tell them? He told them to just sort of go along in order to get along. He told them, no, in John 14, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He told them in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father that by, by, but by me. He told them in verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. He told them in verse 21, He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. In verse 23, he says, If a man loves me, he will keep my words. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings. And the things that I am saying are not really mine, but the Father which has sent me. He said, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will come. In, verse, in chapter 15, verse 1, he says, I'm the true vine. My Father's the husbandman. The branches that don't bear fruit are going to be taken away. The branches that bear fruit are going to be purged. They're going to be clipped, so they'll bring forth more fruit. Verse 4, abide in me, remain in me, be steady in me, be faithful in the truth, and I will be abiding and steadfast in you. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can't do anything. In verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, even as I kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. He told them to love one another as He loved them, which in verse 13 is defined as a sacrificial love, a willingness to sacrifice ourselves to lay down our life. We've been, he told them in verse 16 that He had chosen them, that they were to bring forth fruit told them in verse 20, they persecuted me and they'll persecute you. He said in verse 23, he that hates me hates my father. He told them in verse 26 that I'm going to send you the Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit of truth that comes forth from the Father. And he told them in chapter 16, I've told you these things so you won't be offended when all these problems, all these difficulties, all these things happen. It's going to happen. But you know, people do become offended. Christ said in Matthew 24, many will be offended. Some are going to take offense because people. Some are going to be offended by the truth. They're not, they're not, they don't like correction. And God's Word is a sharp two-edged sword. It will correct. Some will be offended by events. Things start happening. You know, you read back in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Paul is writing to Timothy and he says, I've, finished, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the course. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give me at that day. And then he told Timothy, in 2 Timothy 4.10, he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now, Demas was one of the assistants that Paul had had. But Paul was thrown in jail in Rome. It looked like everything was crashing down. It was all falling apart. Here was Paul thrown in jail. Here were things scattered. Here was all sorts of confusion and problems. Demas loved this present world. He didn't want to give up this world. And he certainly didn't want to go to jail. Stayed there in Rome where Paul was. Why, they'll have to throw him in jail too. They killed Paul. They certainly might kill him. Demas, Demas returned to Thessalonica, having loved this present world. We read in John chapter 12. John 12, verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. You know, there were some leaders among the Jewish community. There were leaders, top-ranking men in the Jewish community that knew Jesus of Nazareth was teaching the truth. They knew what the truth was. They could read it in the Scriptures of the Old Testament. They understood it. They knew it. They believed that He was teaching the truth. But because of the Pharisees who had control of the synagogues, because of the Pharisees, they did not confess Him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They knew what the truth was. Oh yeah, we believe the truth. 
Were they willing to publicly lay it on the line and say, that's the way it is? Oh, no. Because they thought it would be cast out of the synagogues. They loved the praise of men more than they loved the praise of God. Men were more real to them than God was. You see, they took, they didn't love the truth enough. What's laid out in the Scriptures is that many will be offended. Some will be offended when the going gets tough, when the problems come on, persecution, difficulties, adversities. They love the world too much. They love what other people think about them. They love the praise of men. They love the prestige. They love various things, but they don't love the truth enough. Because you see, loving the truth is a key to not is, is one of the most vital keys to not being offended. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 165, Great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Great peace have those that love your law. They love it more than they love anything else. The truth is important. They have peace because they love the law and nothing offends them. The problems, the difficulties, the adversities, what people say and do, all of these things come and go. But you see, they're focused. Events are not going to shake them and offend them. Circumstances, the things that happen, their focus is on God and on what God says. They love the praise of God more than they love the praise of men. Great peace of those that love thy law. They're not in turmoil. Nothing shall offend them. You know, what, what do you do to avoid being in that category of being offended? Well, we have to love God's law. We have to love God's law more than we love other things, more than we love the praise of man, more than we love this present world. If we love God's law, we'll have great peace. We won't be offended. If we believe and follow God, you know, the Syro, this Syrophoenician woman we read about in Matthew 15, she had a humble, faithful attitude. An attitude of humility and faith. And I'll tell you what, you can't offend an attitude of humility and faith. That woman wasn't offended by what Christ said because she was humble. She had a childlike, humble attitude. She was not trying to, to impress everyone as to what her status was and how important she was and this and that. She recognized where the truth was and she wanted it. She knew that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. She believed that. And her faith and her confidence was anchored. And Christ bore testimony to her faith and to her example. You know, we read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3 talks about, this is a key to understanding about faith, it talks about that these indiv- it talks about individuals in verse 7 who are ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, Janus and Jambres, uh, men of corrupt minds, reprobate, proceed no further. Their folly will be manifest unto all men. Then, as Paul goes through, he exhorts these things, exhorts uh, Timothy in all these areas. On back in, in, cha- in chapter 2, in verse 19, notice Paul is... is talks about in verse 16 about the profane and vain babblings and how this this is going to just eat away like a cancer and, and just devour. He gives some examples in his day. In verse 19 he says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal, the Lord knows them that are His. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity, depart from lawlessness. Now, the seal of God stands sure. The foundation stands sure, having this seal. God knows who's who. He knows what's what. You see, faith is anchored on the fact that God said it and I believe it. God knows who's who and He knows what's what. So when events are overwhelming and when there's persecution, when there's difficulty and there's adversity and there are all sorts of problems, God knows. If we have an attitude of humility and an attitude of faith anchored on the fact that God knows and we believe that, We don't have to take offense. We go to God. We recognize our inability to sustain ourselves. So we go to God for the help. A humble, faithful attitude. A deep love of the truth. And what about people? Well, you know what? A forgiving attitude can go a long way. I know of nobody that exemplified it any more than Stephen. You know, Stephen preached a sermon. You can read it in Acts chapter 7. Verse 2, Stephen said, Men and brethren and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. And he goes through about God's dealing with Abraham and Jacob and sort of gives a synopsis as he dealt with Moses. And he talks about all of the things that have happened and how the ancestors of of Israel had rebelled against God time and time again. 
And he said finally in verse 51, uh, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit. As your father did, so did you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? You, re- you received the law, verse 53, by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They were offended. And did they repent? No. You know, you can read back in Acts 2 of some who heard what Peter said, and they were cut to the heart, and they said, what do we do about it? And he said, repent. These heard it, and they were cut to the heart, but they were offended because they loved their status, they loved their prestige, they loved their, the way that they looked in the eyes of others more than other things, and they were furious. In verse 55, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfast into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, which is sort of an amazing thing if God didn't have a body and... Christ didn't, and God's everywhere, and nobody was in heaven anyway. But uh, uh, anyway, maybe this is a metaphor. Well, Well, Stephen looked up, and he saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus Christ standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. They cried with a loud voice, stopped their ears, ran on him with one accord, cast him out of the city, stoned him. Verse 59, as they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. What was Stephen's last thought? Forgiveness. Did Stephen take offense at the way he was treated? No. Did the Pharisees take offense at the way they were treated? They took offense at the truth. It contrasts. A total contrast. Many will be offended because the way to avoid offense doesn't come naturally. It's far more natural to hold a grudge than it is to forgive. You ever notice that? That comes a lot easier, a lot more natural. Get even, retaliate, I'll fix you. It would have been very understandable if Stephen had sort of had the attitude, you guys just wait, boy, I'm going to fry you when I get the chance. None of us would have been tempted, I'm sure. Stephen exemplified a remarkable attitude. And you know, there was a young man there at whose feet they laid the clothes, they laid their coats, and he saw what took place. And he went on in the aftermath of that. That was something that was evidently vividly impressed into his mind. He saw something. He couldn't get it away from his mind. He couldn't get rid of it. In a matter of just a few years later, a couple of years later, that young man, came to conversion and repentance and went on to become the most dynamic apostle of the first century. The man that God used to write more of the New Testament than any other one person. At the time Stephen was stoned, he was known as Saul of Tarsus. We know him better as the Apostle Paul. Stephen's example had a profound impact. Stephen didn't take offense when the going got rough because he loved God's truth. He loved God's way more than anything else. And he had an attitude of forgiveness toward those around. You know, that's that's an important key. Christ emphasized it in Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 35, he says, Love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward will be great. You'll be the children of the highest. He's kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be you therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom with the same measure you meet it with all. It will be measured to you again. An attitude of love. An attitude of mercy. An attitude of forgiveness. So what do we see here in terms of being offended? Christ warned many will be offended. We look through the Scriptures and we find time after time after time people were offended. Well, I'll tell you who's not offended. And those who, are ex- who exemplify attitudes of love, mercy, humility, devotion to the truth, faith toward God. See, those attitudes aren't offended. If we don't want to be in the category of being offended, and none of us, you know, we put a sign-up list up, but I don't think anybody would sign it. None of us want to be in the category of those who go by the wayside. Christ said many will. The only reason why any of us will be in that category of being offended is because of our pride, because of an attitude of 
being unmerciful and unforgiving ourselves, because of being more concerned with what people will think and prestige, because of all of the various things that caused others time after time to be offended. We've got to go to God for this attitude of merciful, compassion, love, and forgiveness for others, an attitude to deepen our devotion and loyalty to the truth, our devotion, our loyalty, our faith and confidence in God, and the humility to accept what God brings and to seek to profit from it, to go to God for that help. The Bible gives some very important keys. Christ laid them out for us. And I think as we focus on that, and brethren, we live in perilous times, dangerous times. That's what Paul said. He said, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, if we're living in the last days, we're living in perilous times, dangerous times. You know what happens if you're in perilous water? It's easy to get shipwrecked, easy to get your boat turned over. We don't want to have our boat turned over. We want to progress on through these perilous rapids and on into the kingdom of God. In the last days, perilous times will come. We have to know the rocks and the shoals that can shipwreck our boat as we proceed through to the kingdom of God. Many will be offended. The pride, the lack of faith, the lack of mercy will cause them to take offense. We have to go to God for the things that will enable us to avoid being offended and being focused on God and being focused on His truth. And as we do that, we're in a position.